Hello, and welcome to Bite Sized Audio on YouTube. I'm Simon Stanhope, actor, audiobook narrator, and curator of this channel. On the channel, you can hear my narrations, more than a hundred to date and more to come, of classic short stories, mostly from the Victorian and Edwardian eras, including vintage ghost stories, detective stories, and other classic tales of mystery and suspense. To accompany the narrations, I've put a short profile of the authors in the video description, as well as some general background notes on the stories for those who'd like to know more. If you enjoy this content, please hit subscribe, like, share, leave a comment if you'd like to, and thank you for listening. To Prove an Alibi by L. T. Mead and Robert Eustace I first met Arthur Cressley in the late spring of 1892. I had been spending the winter in Egypt and was returning to Liverpool. One calm evening, about eleven o'clock, while we were still in the Mediterranean, I went on deck to smoke a final cigar before turning in. After pacing up and down for a time, I leant over the taffrail and began idly watching the tiny wavelets with their crests of white fire as they rippled away from the vessel's side. Presently I became aware of someone standing near me, and turning saw that it was one of my fellow passengers, a young man whose name I knew, but whose acquaintance I had not yet made. He was entered in the passenger list as Arthur Cressley, belonged to an old family in Derbyshire and was returning home from Western Australia, where he had made a lot of money. I offered him a light, and after a few preliminary remarks we drifted into a desultory conversation. He told me that he had been in Australia for fifteen years, and having done well was now returning to settle in his native land. "'Then you do not intend going out again?' I asked. "'No,' he replied. I would not go through the last fifteen years for double the money I have made. I suppose you will make London your headquarters? Not altogether, but I shall have to spend a good deal of time there. My wish is for a quiet country life, and I intend to take over the old family property. We have a place called Cressley Hall in Derbyshire, which has belonged to us for centuries. It would be a sort of white elephant, for it has fallen into pitiable decay— but luckily I am now in a position to restore it and set it going again in renewed prosperity. "'You are a fortunate man,' I answered. "'Perhaps I am,' he replied. "'Yes, as far as this world's goods go, I suppose I am lucky, considering that I arrived in Australia fifteen years ago with practically no money in my pocket. I shall be glad to be home again, for many reasons— chiefly because I can save the old property from being sold. It is always a pity when a fine old family seat has to go to the hammer for want of funds, I remarked. That is true, and Cressley Hall is a superb old place. There is only one drawback to it, but I don't believe there is anything in that, added Cressley, in a musing tone. Knowing him so little, I did not feel justified in asking for an explanation. I waited, therefore, without speaking. He soon proceeded. "'I suppose I am rather foolish about it,' he continued. "'But if I am superstitious, I have abundant reason. For more than a century and a half there has been a strange fatality about any Cressley occupying the hall. This fatality was first exhibited in 1700, when Barrington Cressley, one of the most abandoned libertines of that time, led his infamous orgies there. Of these even history takes note. There are endless legends as to their nature, one of which is that he had personal dealings with the devil in the large turret-room, the principal bedroom at the hall, and was found dead there on the following morning. Certainly since that date a curious doom has hung over the family— 
and this doom shows itself in a strange way, only attacking those victims who are so unfortunate as to sleep in the turret room. Gilbert Cressley, the young court favourite of George the Third, was found mysteriously murdered there, and my own great-grandfather paid the penalty by losing his reason within those gloomy walls. If the room has such an evil reputation, I wonder that it is occupied, I replied. <laughs> it happens to be far and away the best bedroom in the house, and people always laugh at that sort of thing until they are brought face to face with it. The owner of the property is not only born there, as a rule, but also breathes his last in the old four-poster, the most extraordinary, wonderful old bedstead you ever laid eyes on. Of course, I do not believe in any malevolent influences from the unseen world, but the record of disastrous coincidences in that one room is, to say the least of it, curious. Not that this sort of thing will deter me from going into possession, and I intend to put a lot of money into Cressley Hall. "'Has no one been occupying it lately?' I asked. "'Not recently. An old housekeeper has had charge of the place for the last few years. The agent had orders to sell the hall long ago, but though it has been in the market for a long time, I do not believe there was a single offer. Just before I left Australia, I wired to Murdoch, my agent, that I intended taking over the place, and authorised its withdrawal from the market.' "'Have you no relations?' I inquired. "'None at all. Since I have been away, my only brother died. It is curious to call it going home, when one has no relatives, and only friends who have probably forgotten one.' I could not help feeling sorry for Cressley, as he described the lonely outlook. Of course, with heaps of money and an old family place, he would soon make new friends— but he looked the sort of chap who might be imposed upon, and although he was as nice a fellow as I had ever met, I could not help coming to the conclusion that he was not specially strong, either mentally or physically. He was essentially good-looking, however, and had the indescribable bearing of a man of old family. I wondered how he had managed to make his money. What he told me about his old hall also excited my interest— and as we talked, I managed to allude to my own peculiar hobby, and the delight I took in such old legends. As the voyage flew by, our acquaintance grew apace, ripening into a warm friendship. Cressley told me much of his past life, and finally confided to me one of his real objects in returning to England. While prospecting up-country, he had come across some rich veins of gold— and now his intention was to bring out a large syndicate, in order to acquire the whole property, which, he anticipated, was worth at least a million. He spoke confidently of this great scheme, but always wound up by informing me that the money which he hoped to make was only of interest to him for the purpose of re-establishing Cressley Hall in its ancient splendour. As we talked, I noticed once or twice that a man stood near us, who seemed to take an interest in our conversation. He was a thickly set individual, with a florid complexion and a broad German cast of face. He was an inveterate smoker, and when he stood near us with a pipe in his mouth, the expression of his face was almost a blank. But watching him closely, I saw a look in his eyes which betokened the shrewd man of business, and I could scarcely tell why but I felt uncomfortable in his presence. This man, Wickham by name, managed to pick up an acquaintance with Cressley, and soon they spent a good deal of time together. They made a contrast as they paced up and down on deck, or played cards in the evening, the Englishman being slight and almost fragile in build, the German of the bulldog order, with a manner at once curt and overbearing. I took a dislike to Wickham, and wondered what Cressley could see in him. "'Who is the fellow?' I asked on one occasion, linking my hand in Cressley's arm, and drawing him aside as I spoke. "'Do you mean Wickham?' he answered. "'I am sure I cannot tell you. I never met the chap before this voyage. 
he came on board at King George's Sound, where I also embarked, but he never spoke to me until we were in the Mediterranean. On the whole, Belle, I am inclined to like him. He seems to be downright and honest. He knows a great deal about the bush, too, as he has spent several years there. And he gives you the benefit of his information? I asked. Well, I don't suppose he knows more than I do, and it is doubtful whether he has had so rough a time. Then, in that case, he picks your brains. What do you mean? The young fellow looked at me with those clear grey eyes, which were his most attractive feature. Nothing, I answered. Nothing. Only, if you will be guided by a man nearly double your age, I would take care to tell Wickham as little as possible. Have you ever observed that he happens to be about when you and I are engaged in serious conversation? I can't say that I have. Well, keep your eyes open, and you'll see what I mean. Be as friendly as you like, but don't give him your confidence, that is all. You are rather late in advising me on that score, said Cressley, with a somewhat nervous laugh. Wickham knows all about the old hall by this time. And your superstitious fears with regard to the turret room? I queried. Well, I have hinted at them. You will be surprised, but he is full of sympathy. Tell him no more, I said, in conclusion. Cressley made a sort of half-promise, but looked as if he rather resented my interference. A day or two later we reached Liverpool. I was engaged, long ago, to stay with some friends in the suburbs, and Cressley took up his abode at the Prince's Hotel. His property was some sixty miles away, and when we parted he insisted on my agreeing to come down and see his place as soon as he had put things a little straight. I readily promised to do so, provided we could arrange a visit before my return to London. Nearly a week went by, and I saw nothing of Cressley. Then, on a certain morning, he called to see me. "'How are you getting on?' I asked. "'Capitally,' he replied. "'I have been down to the hall several times with my agent, Murdoch, and though the place is in the most shocking condition, I shall soon put things in order.' But what I have come specially to ask you now is whether you can get away to-day and come with me to the hall for a couple of nights. I had arranged with the agent to go down this afternoon in his company, but he has been suddenly taken ill. He is rather bad, I believe, and cannot possibly come with me. He has ordered the housekeeper to get a couple of rooms ready, and though I am afraid it will be rather roughing it, I shall be awfully glad if you can come.' I had arranged to meet a man in London on special business that very evening, and could not put him off. But my irresistible desire to see the old place, from the description I had heard of it, decided me to make an effort to fall in as well as I could with Cressley's plans. "'I wish I could go with you to-day,' I said. "'But that, as it happens, is out of the question. I must run up to town on some pressing business, but if you will allow me, I can easily come back again to-morrow. Can you not put off your visit until to-morrow evening? No, I am afraid I cannot do that. I have to meet several of the tenants, and have made all arrangements to go by the five o'clock train this afternoon. He looked depressed at my refusal, and after a moment said thoughtfully, I wish you could have come with me to-day. When Murdoch could not come, I thought of you at once. It would have made all the difference. Well, I'm sorry, I replied, but I can promise faithfully to be with you tomorrow. I shall enjoy seeing your wonderful old hall beyond anything, and as to roughing it, I'm used to that. You will not mind spending one night there by yourself? He looked at me as if he were about to speak, but no words came from his lips. "'What is the matter?' I said, giving him an earnest glance. "'By the way, are you going to sleep in the turret room?' "'I am afraid there is no help for it. The housekeeper is certain to get it ready for me. The owner of the property always sleeps there, 
and it would look like a confession of weakness to ask to be put into another bedroom. Nevertheless, if you are nervous, I should not mind that, I said. Oh, I don't know that I am absolutely nervous, Belle, but all the same I have a superstition. At the present moment I have the queerest sensation. I feel as if I ought not to pay this visit to the hall. <laughs> if you intend to live there by and by, you must get over this sort of thing, I remarked. Oh, yes, I must, and I would not yield to it on any account whatever. I am sorry I even mentioned it to you. It is good of you to promise to come to-morrow, and I shall look forward to seeing you. By what train will you come? We looked up the local timetable, and I decided on a train which would leave Liverpool about five o'clock. "'The very one that I shall go down by today," said Cressley. "'That's capital. I'll meet you with a conveyance of some sort and drive you over. The house is a good two hours' drive from the station, and you cannot get a trap there for love or money.' "'By the way,' I said, "'is there much the matter with your agent?' "'I cannot tell you. He seems bad enough. I went up to his house this morning and saw the wife. It appears that he was suddenly taken ill with a sort of asthmatic attack, to which he is subject. While I was talking to Mrs. Murdoch, a messenger came down to say that her husband specially wished to see me. So we both went to his room, but he had dozed off into a queer, restless sleep before we arrived. The wife said he must not be awakened on any account— but I caught a glimpse of him, and he certainly looked bad, and was moaning as if in a good deal of pain. She gave me the key of a bureau in his room, and I took out some estimates, and left a note for him, telling him to come on as soon as he was well enough. "'And your visit to his room never roused him?' I said. "'No, although Mrs. Murdoch and I made a pretty good bit of noise, moving about and opening and shutting drawers, his moans were quite heart-rending. He was evidently in considerable pain, and I was glad to get away, as that sort of thing always upsets me. "'Who is this Murdoch?' I asked. "'Oh, the man who has looked after the place for years. I was referred to him by my solicitors. He seems a most capable person, and I hope to goodness he won't be ill long. If he is, I shall find myself in rather a fix.' I made no reply to this, and soon afterwards Cressley shook hands with me and departed on his way. I went to my room, packed my belongings, and took the next train to town. The business which I had to get through occupied the whole of the evening, and also some hours of the following day. I found I was not able to start for Liverpool before the 12.10 train at Euston, and should not therefore arrive at Lime Street before five o'clock, too late to catch the train for Brent, the nearest station to Cressley's place. Another train left Central Station for Brent, however, at seven o'clock, and I determined to wire to Cressley to tell him to meet me by the latter train. This was the last train in the day, but there was no fear of my missing it. I arrived at Lime Street almost to the moment, and drove straight to the Prince's Hotel, where I had left my bag the day before. Here a telegram awaited me. It was from Cressley, and ran as follows. "'Hope this will reach you in time. If so, call at Murdoch's house, number 12, Melville Gardens. If possible, see him and get documents referred to in Schedule A. He will know what you mean. Most important. Cressley.' I glanced at the clock in the hall. It was now a quarter past five. My train would leave at seven. I had plenty of time to get something to eat, and then go to Murdoch's. Having dispatched my telegram to Cressley, telling him to look out for me by the train which arrived at Brent at nine o'clock, I ordered a meal, ate it, and then, hailing a cab, gave the driver the number of Murdoch's house. Melville Gardens was situated somewhat in the suburbs, and it was twenty minutes' drive from my hotel. When we drew up at Murdoch's door, I told the cabman to wait, and, getting out, rang the bell. The servant who answered my summons told me that the agent was still very ill, and could not be seen by anyone. I then inquired for the wife. 
I was informed that she was out, but would be back soon. I looked at my watch. It was just six o'clock. I determined to wait to see Mrs. Murdoch if possible. Having paid and dismissed my cab, I was shown into a small, untidily kept parlour, where I was left to my own meditations. The weather was hot and the room close. The minutes flew by, and Mrs. Murdoch did not put in an appearance. I looked at my watch, which now pointed to twenty minutes past six. It would take me, in an ordinary cab, nearly twenty minutes to reach the station. In order to make all safe, I ought to leave Murdoch's house in ten minutes from now at the latest. I went and stood by the window, watching anxiously for Mrs. Murdoch to put in an appearance. Melville Gardens was a somewhat lonely place, and few people passed the house, which was old and shabby. It had evidently not been done up for years. I was just turning round in order to ring the bell to leave a message with the servant, when the room door was opened, and, to my astonishment, in walked Wickham, the man I had last seen on board the Euphrates. He came up to me at once, and held out his hand. "'No doubt you are surprised at seeing me here, Mr. Bell,' he exclaimed. "'I certainly was for a moment,' I answered, but then I added— the world is a small place, and one soon gets accustomed to acquaintances cropping up in all sorts of unlikely quarters. "'Why unlikely?' said Wickham. "'Why should I not know Murdoch, who happens to be a very special and very old friend of mine? I might as well ask you why you are interested in him.' "'Because I happen to be a friend of Arthur Cressley's,' I answered, "'and have come here on his business.' "'And so am I also a friend of Cressley's. "'He has asked me to go and see him at Cressley Hall some day, "'and I hope to avail myself of his invitation. "'The servant told me that you were waiting for Mrs. Murdoch. "'Can I give her any message from you?' "'Well, I want to see Murdoch himself,' I said, after a pause. "'Do you think that it is possible for me to have an interview with him?' Well, "'I left him just now, and he was asleep,' said Wickham. He is still very ill, and I think the doctor is a little anxious about him. It would not do to disturb him on any account. Of course, if he happens to awake, he might be able to tell you what you want to know. By the way, has it anything to do with Cressley Hall? Yes, I have just had a telegram from Cressley, and the message is somewhat important. You are quite sure that Murdoch is asleep? He was when I left the room— but I will go up again and see. Are you going to London tonight, Mr. Bell? No, I am going down to Cressley Hall, and I must catch the seven o'clock train. I have not a moment to wait. As I spoke, I took out my watch. It only wants five and twenty minutes to seven, I said, and I never care to run a train to the last moment. There is no help for it. I suppose I must go without seeing Murdoch. Cressley will in all probability send down a message tomorrow for the papers he requires. "'Just stay a moment,' said Wickham, putting on an anxious expression. "'It is a great pity that you should not see Cressley's agent, if it is as vital as all that. Ah, and here comes Mrs. Murdoch. Wait one moment, I'll go and speak to her.' He went out of the room, and I heard him say something in a low voice in the passage. A woman's voice replied, and the next instant Mrs. Murdoch stood before me. She was a tall woman, with a sallow face and sandy hair. She had a blank sort of stare about her, and scarcely any expression. Now she fixed her dull, light blue eyes on my face, and held out her hand. "'You are Mr. Bell,' she said. "'I have heard of you, of course, from Mr. Cressley. So you are going to spend to-night with him at Cressley Hall.' I am glad, for it is a lonely place, the most lonely place I know. Uh, pardon me, I interrupted. I cannot stay to talk to you now, or I shall miss my train. Can I see your husband, or can I not? She glanced at Wickham. Then she said, with hesitation, If he is asleep, it would not do to disturb him, but there is a chance of his being awake now. I don't quite understand about the papers.' I wish I did. 
It would be best for you to see him, certainly. Follow me upstairs.' "'And I'll tell you what,' called Wickham after us, "'I'll go and engage a cab, so that you shall lose as short a time as possible, Mr. Bell.' I thanked him, and followed the wife upstairs. The stairs were narrow and steep, and we soon reached the small landing at the top. Four bedrooms opened into it. Mrs. Murdoch turned the handle of the one which exactly faced the stairs, and we both entered. Here the blinds were down, and the chamber was considerably darkened. The room was a small one, and the greater part of the space was occupied by an old-fashioned Albert bedstead, with the curtains pulled forward. Within I could just see the shadowy outline of a figure, and I distinctly heard the feeble groans of the sick man. "'Ah, what a pity! My husband is still asleep!' said Mrs. Murdoch, as she turned softly round to me, and put her finger to her lips. "'It would injure him very much to awaken him,' she said. "'You can go and look at him if you like. You will see how very ill he is. I wonder if I could help you with regard to the papers you want, Mr. Bell.' "'I want the documents referred to in Schedule A,' I answered. "'Schedule A,' she repeated, speaking under her breath. "'I remember that name. Surely all the papers relating to it are in this drawer. I think I can get them for you.' She crossed the room as she spoke, and, standing with her back to the bedstead, took a bunch of keys from a table which stood near, and fitted one into the lock of a high bureau made of mahogany. She pulled open a drawer, and began to examine its contents. While she was so occupied, I approached the bed, and, bending slightly forward, took a good stare at the sick man. I had never seen Murdoch before. There was little doubt that he was ill. He looked very ill indeed. His face was long and cadaverous. The cheekbones were high, and the cheeks below were much sunken in. The lips, which were clean-shaven, were slightly drawn apart, and some broken irregular teeth were visible. The eyebrows were scanty, and the hair was much worn away from the high and hollow forehead. The man looked sick unto death. I had seldom seen any one with an expression like his. The closed eyes were much sunken, and the moaning which came from the livid lips was horrible to listen to. After giving Murdoch a long and earnest stare, I stepped back from the bed, and was just about to speak to Mrs. Murdoch, who was rustling papers in the drawer, when the most strong and irresistible curiosity assailed me. I could not account for it, but I felt bound to yield to its suggestions. I turned again, and bent close over the sick man. Surely there was something monotonous about that deep-drawn breath. Those moans, too, came at wonderfully regular intervals. Scarcely knowing why I did it, I stretched out my hand, and laid it on the forehead. Good God! What was the matter? I felt myself turning cold. The perspiration stood out on my own brow. I had not touched a living forehead at all. Flesh was flesh. It was impossible to mistake the feel. But there was no flesh here— the figure in the bed was neither a living nor a dead man. It was a wax representation of one. But why did it moan? And how was it possible for it to breathe? Making the greatest effort of my life, I repressed an exclamation, and when Mrs. Murdoch approached me with the necessary papers in her hand, took them from her in my usual manner— "'These all relate to Schedule A,' she said. "'I hope I am not doing wrong in giving them to you without my husband's leave. "'He looks very ill, does he not?' "'He looks as bad as he can look,' I answered. "'I moved towards the door. "'Something in my tone must have alarmed her, "'for a curious expression of fear dilated the pupils of her light blue eyes. "'She followed me downstairs. "'A hansom was waiting for me.' I nodded to Wickham, did not even wait to shake hands with Mrs. Murdoch, and sprang into the cab. "'Central Station!' I shouted to the man, and then, as he whipped up his horse and flew down the street, "'A sovereign, if you'll get there before seven o'clock!' 
We were soon dashing quickly along the streets. I did not know Liverpool well, and consequently could not exactly tell where the man was going. When I got into the hansom, it wanted twelve minutes to seven o'clock. These minutes were quickly flying, and still no station. "'Are you sure you are going right?' I shouted through the hole in the roof. "'You'll be there in a minute, sir,' he answered. "'It's Lime Street Station you want, isn't it?' "'No, Central Station,' I answered. "'I told you, Central Station. Drive there at once, like the very devil. I must catch that train, for it is the last one to-night.' "'All right, sir, I can do it,' he cried, whipping up his horse again. Once more I pulled out my watch. The hands pointed to three minutes to seven. At ten minutes past we were driving into the station. I flung the man half a sovereign, and darted into the booking office. "'To Brent, sir, the last train has just gone,' said the clerk, with an impassive stare at me through the little window. I flung my bag down in disgust, and swore a great oath. But for that idiot of a driver I should have just caught the train. All of a sudden a horrible thought flashed through my brain. Had the cabman been bribed by Wickham? No directions could have been plainer than mine. I had told the man to drive to Central Station. Central Station did not sound the least like Lime Street Station. How was it possible for him to make so grave a mistake? The more I considered the matter, the more certain I was that a black plot was brewing, and that Wickham was in the thick of it. My brain began to whirl with excitement. What was the matter? Why was a lay figure in Murdoch's bed? Why had I been taken upstairs to see it? Without any doubt, both Mrs. Murdoch and Wickham wished me to see what was such an admirable imitation of a sick man— an imitation so good, with those ghastly moans coming from the lips, that it would have taken in the sharpest detective in Scotland Yard. I myself was deceived, until I touched the forehead. This state of things had not been brought to pass without a reason. What was that reason? Could it be possible that Murdoch was wanted elsewhere, and it was thought well that I should see him in order to prove an alibi— should he be suspected of a ghastly crime? My God! What could this mean? From the first I had mistrusted Wickham. What was he doing in Murdoch's house? For what purpose had he bribed the driver of the cab in order to make me lose my train? The more I thought, the more certain I was that Cressley was in grave danger, and I now determined, cost what it might, to get to him that night— I left the station, took a cab, and drove back to my hotel. I asked to see the manager. A tall, dark man in a frock-coat emerged from a door at the back of the office, and inquired what he could do for me. I begged permission to speak to him alone, and we passed into his private room. "'I am in an extraordinary position,' I began. "'Circumstances of a private nature make it absolutely necessary that I should go to a place called Cressley Hall,' about fourteen miles from Brent. Brent is sixty miles down the line, and the last train has gone. I could take a special, but there might be an interminable delay at Brent, and I prefer to drive straight to Cressley Hall across country. Can you assist me by directing me to some good jobmaster from whom I can hire a carriage and horses? The man looked at me with raised eyebrows. He evidently thought I was mad. "'I mean what I say,' I added, "'and am prepared to back my words with a substantial sum. "'Can you help me?' "'I dare say you might get a carriage and horses to do it,' he replied. "'But it is a very long way, and over a hilly country. "'No two horses could go such a distance without rest. "'You would have to change from time to time as you went. "'I will send across to the hotel stables for my man, "'and you can see him about it.' He rang the bell and gave his orders. In a few moments the jobmaster came in. I hurriedly explained to him what I wanted. At first he said it was impossible, that his best horses were out, and that those he had in his stables could not possibly attempt such a journey. 
But when I brought out my checkbook and offered to advance any sum in reason, he hesitated. "'Of course there is one way in which it might be managed, sir. I would take you myself as far as Ovenden, which is five and twenty miles from here. There, I know, we could get a pair of fresh horses from the Swan. And if we wired at once from here, horses might be ready at Carlton, which is another twenty miles on the road.' "'But at our best, sir, it will be between two and three in the morning before we get to Brent.' "'I am sorry to hear you say so,' I answered. "'But it is better to arrive then than to wait until to-morrow. "'Please send the necessary telegram off without a moment's delay and get the carriage ready.' "'Put the horses in at once, John,' said the manager. "'You had better take the light wagonette. "'You ought to get there between one and two in the morning with that.' Then, he added, as the man left the room, "'I suppose, sir, your business is very urgent.' "'It is,' I replied shortly. He looked at me as if he would like to question me further, but refrained. A few moments later I had taken my seat beside the driver, and we were speeding at a good round pace through the streets of Liverpool. We passed quickly through the suburbs and out into the open country— The evening was a lovely one, and the country looked its best. It was difficult to believe, as I drove through the peaceful landscape, that in all probability a dark deed was in contemplation, and that the young man to whom I had taken a most sincere liking was in danger of his life. As I drove silently by my companion's side, I reviewed the whole situation. The more I thought of it, the less I liked it, On board the Euphrates, Wickham had been abnormally interested in Cressley. Cressley had himself confided to him his superstitious dread with regard to the turret room. Cressley had come home with a fortune, and if he floated his syndicate he would be a millionaire. Wickham scarcely looked like a rich man. Then why should he know Murdoch, and why should a lay figure be put in Murdoch's bed? Why, also, through a most unnatural accident, should I have lost my train? The more I thought, the graver and graver became my fears. Gradually darkness settled over the land, and then a rising moon flooded the country in its weird light. I had been on many a wild expedition before, but in some ways never a wilder than this. Its very uncertainty, wrapped as it was in unformed suspicions, gave it an air of inexpressible mystery. On and on we went, reaching Ovenden between nine and ten at night. Here horses were ready for us, and we again started on our way. When we got to Carlton, however, there came a hitch in my well-formed arrangements. We drew up at the little inn to find the place in total darkness, and all the inhabitants evidently in bed and asleep. With some difficulty, we roused the landlord, and asked why the horses which had been telegraphed for had not been got ready. "'We did not get them when the second telegram arrived,' was the reply. "'The second telegram?' I cried, my heart beating fast. "'What do you mean?' "'There were two, sir, both coming from the same stables. The first was written desiring us to have the horses ready at any cost. The second contradicted the first and said that the gentleman had changed his mind, and was not going. On receipt of that, sir, I shut up the house as usual, and we all went to bed. I am very sorry if there has been any mistake. There has, and a terrible one, I could not help muttering under my breath. My fears were getting graver than ever. Who had sent the second telegram? Was it possible that I had been followed by Wickham, who took these means of circumventing me. "'We must get horses, and at once,' I said. "'Never mind about the second telegram. It was a mistake.' Peach, the jobmaster, muttered an oath. "'I can't understand what is up,' he said. He looked mystified, and not too well pleased. Then he added, "'These horses can't go another step, sir.' "'They must, if we can get no others.' I said. I went up to him, and began to whisper in his ear. "'This is a matter of life and death, my good friend. 
Only the direst necessity takes me on this journey. The second telegram, without doubt, was sent by a man whom I am trying to circumvent. I know what I am saying. We must get horses, or these must go on. We have not an instant to lose. There is a conspiracy afoot to do serious injury to the owner of Cressley Hall. What? The young gentleman who has just come from Australia? You don't mean to say he is in danger? said Peach. He is in the gravest danger. I don't mind who knows. I have reason for my fears. While I was speaking, the landlord drew near. He overheard some of my last words. The landlord and Peach now exchanged glances. After a moment, the landlord spoke. "'A neighbour of ours, sir, has got two good horses,' he said. "'He is the doctor in this village. I believe he'll lend them, if the case is as urgent as you say.' "'Go and ask him,' I cried. "'You shall have ten pounds if we are on the road in five minutes from the present moment.' At this hint the landlord flew. He came back in an incredibly short space of time, accompanied by the doctor's coachman leading the horses. They were quickly harnessed to the wagonette, and once more we started on our way. "'Now, drive as you never drove before in the whole course of your life,' I said to Peach, "'Money is no object. We have still fifteen miles to go, and over a rough country. You can claim any reward in reason if you get to Cressley Hall within an hour.' "'It cannot be done, sir,' he replied. But then he glanced at me, and some of the determination in my face was reflected in his. He whipped up the horses. They were thoroughbred animals, and worked well under pressure.' We reached the gates of Cressley Hall between two and three in the morning. Here I thought it best to draw up, and told my coachman that I should not need his services any longer. "'If you are afraid of mischief, sir, would it not be best for me to lie about here?' he asked. "'I'd rather be in the neighbourhood, in case you want me. I am interested in this here job, sir.' "'You may well be, my man. God grant it is not a black business. Well—' "'Walk the horses up and down, if you like. "'If you see nothing of me within the next couple of hours, "'judge that matters are all right, "'and return with the horses to Carlton.' "'This being arranged, I turned from Peach "'and entered the lodge gates. "'Just inside was a low cottage surrounded by trees. "'I paused for a moment to consider what I had better do. "'My difficulty now was how to obtain admittance to the hall— for, of course, it would be shut up, and all its inhabitants asleep at this hour. Suddenly an idea struck me. I determined to knock up the lodge-keeper, and to enlist her assistance. I went across to the door, and presently succeeded in rousing the inmates. A woman of about fifty appeared. I explained to her my position, and begged of her to give me her help. She hesitated at first, in unutterable astonishment, but then— seeing something in my face which convinced her, I suppose, of the truth of my story, for it was necessary to alarm her in order to induce her to do anything. She said she would do what I wished. "'I know the room where Mitchell, the old housekeeper, sleeps,' she said, "'and we can easily wake him by throwing stones up at his window. If you'll just wait a minute, I'll put a shawl over my head and go with you.' She ran into an inner room and quickly reappeared. Together we made our way along the drive, which, far as I could see, ran through a park studded with old timber. We went round the house to the back entrance, and the woman, after a delay of two or three moments, during which I was on thorns, managed to wake up Mitchell, the housekeeper. He came to his window, threw it open, and poked out his head. "'What can be wrong?' he said. "'It is Mr. Bell, James,' was the reply. "'the gentleman who has been expected at the hall all the evening. "'He has come now, and wants you to admit him.' "'The old man said that he would come downstairs. "'He did so, and, opening a door, stood in front of it, barring my entrance. "'Are you really the gentleman Mr. Cressley has been expecting?' he said. "'I am,' I replied. "'I missed my train, and was obliged to drive out.' "'There is urgent need why I should see your master immediately. Where is he?' "'I hope in bed, sir, and asleep. 
It is nearly three o'clock in the morning. Never mind the hour, I said. I must see Mr. Cressley immediately. Can you take me to his room? If I am sure that you are Mr. John Bell, said the old man, glancing at me with not unnatural suspicion. Rest assured on that point. Here, this is my card, and here is a telegram which I received to-day from your master. But master sent no telegram to-day. You must be mistaken. This is from him. Well, I don't understand it, sir, but you look honest, and I suppose I must trust you. You will do well to do so, I said. He moved back, and I entered the house. He took me down a passage, and then into a lofty chamber, which probably was the old banqueting hall. As well as I could see by the light of the candle, it was floored and panelled with black oak. Round the walls stood figures of knights in armour, with flags and banners hanging from the panels above. I followed the old man up a broad staircase, and along endless corridors, to a more distant part of the building. We turned now abruptly to our right, and soon began to ascend some turret stairs. "'In which room is your master?' I asked. "'This is his room, sir,' said the man. He stood still, and pointed to a door. "'Stay where you are. I may want you,' I said. I seized his candle, and holding it above my head, opened the door. The room was a large one, and when I entered was in total darkness. I fancied I heard a rustling in the distance, but could see no one. Then, as my eyes got accustomed to the faint light caused by the candle, I observed, at the further end of the chamber, a large four-poster bedstead. I immediately noticed something very curious about it. I turned round to the old housekeeper. "'Did you really say that Mr. Cressley was sleeping in this room?' I asked. "'Oh, yes, sir. He must be in bed some hours ago. I left him in the library, hunting up old papers, and he told me he was tired and was going to rest early.' "'He is not in the bed,' I said. "'Not in the bed, sir? Good God!' A note of horror came into the man's voice. "'What in the name of fortune is the matter with the bed?' As the man spoke, I rushed forward. Was it really a bed at all? If it was, I had never seen a stranger one. Upon it, covering it from head to foot, was a thick mattress, from the sides of which tassels were hanging— there was no human being lying on the mattress, nor was it made up with sheets and blankets, like an ordinary bed. I glanced above me. The posts at the four corners of the bedstead stood like masts. I saw at once what had happened. The canopy had descended upon the bed. Was Cressley beneath? With a shout I desired the old man to come forward, and between us we seized the mattress— and exerting all our force, tried to drag it from the bed. In a moment I saw it was fixed by cords that held it tightly in its place. Whipping out my knife, I severed these, and then hurled the heavy weight from the bed. Beneath lay Cressley, still as death. I put my hand on his heart, and uttered a thankful exclamation. It was still beating. I was in time. I had saved him— after all, nothing else mattered during that supreme moment of thankfulness. A few seconds longer beneath that smothering mass, and he would have been dead. By what a strange sequence of events had I come to his side, just in the nick of time! "'We must take him from this room before he recovers consciousness,' I said to the old man, who was surprised and horror-stricken. "'But, sir, in the name of heaven, what has happened?' "'Let us examine the bed, and I will tell you,' I said. I held up the candle as I spoke. A glance at the posts was all sufficient to show me how the deed had been done. The canopy above, on which the heavy mattress had been placed, was held in position by strong cords, which ran through pulleys at the top of the posts. These were thick and heavy enough to withstand the strain. When the cords were released, the canopy, with its heavy weight— must quickly descend upon the unfortunate sleeper, 
who would be smothered beneath it in a few seconds. Who had planned and executed this murderous device? There was not a soul to be seen. "'We will take Mr. Cressley into another room, and then come back,' I said to the housekeeper. "'Is there one where we can place him?' Oh, "'Yes, sir,' was the instant reply. "'There's a room on the next floor, which was got ready for you.' "'Capital,' I answered. "'We will convey him there at once.' We did so, and after using some restoratives, he came to himself. When he saw me, he gazed at me with an expression of horror on his face. "'Am I alive, or is it a dream?' he said. "'You are alive, but you have had a narrow escape of your life,' I answered. I then told him how I had found him. He sat up as I began to speak, and as I continued my narrative, his eyes dilated with an expression of terror which I have seldom seen equalled. "'You do not know what I have lived through,' he said at last. "'I only wonder I retain my reason. Oh, that awful room! No wonder men died and went mad there!' "'Well, speak, Cressley. I am all attention,' I said. "'You will be the better when you have unburdened yourself.' "'I can tell you what happened in a few words,' he answered. "'You know I mentioned the horrid sort of presentiment I had about coming here at all. "'That first night I could not make up my mind to sleep in the house, "'so I went to the little inn at Brent. "'I received your telegram yesterday and went to meet you by the last train. "'When you did not come, I had a tussle with myself, "'but I could think of no decent excuse for deserting the old place.' and so came back. My intention was to set up the greater part of the night, arranging papers in the library. The days are long now, and I thought I might go to bed when morning broke. I was irresistibly sleepy, however, and went up to my room soon after one o'clock. I was determined to think of nothing unpleasant, and got quickly into bed, taking the precaution first to lock the door. I placed the key under my pillow, and, being very tired, soon fell into a heavy sleep. I awoke suddenly, after what seemed but a few minutes, to find the room dark, for the moon must just have set. I was very sleepy, and I wondered vaguely why I had awakened. And then suddenly, without warning, and without cause, a monstrous, unreasonable fear seized me. An indefinable intuition told me that I was not alone, that some horrible presence was near. I do not think the certainty of immediate death could have inspired me with a greater dread than that which suddenly came upon me. I dared not stir hand nor foot. My powers of reason and resistance were paralysed. At last, by an immense effort, I nerved myself to see the worst. Slowly, very slowly, I turned my head and opened my eyes. Against the tapestry, at the further corner of the room, in the dark shadow, stood a figure. It stood out quite boldly, emanating from itself a curious light. I had no time to think of phosphorus. It never occurred to me that any trick was being played upon me. I felt certain that I was looking at my ancestor, Barrington Cressley, who had come back to torture me, in order to make me give up possession. The figure was that of a man, six feet high, and broad in proportion. The face was bent forward, and turned toward me, but in the uncertain light I could neither see the features nor the expression. The figure stood as still as a statue, and was evidently watching me. At the end of a moment, which seemed to me an eternity, it began to move, and, with a slow and silent step, approached me. I lay perfectly still, every muscle braced, and watched the figure between half-closed eyelids. It was now within a foot or two of me, and I could distinctly see the face. What was my horror to observe that it wore the features of my agent, Murdoch? "'Murdoch!' I cried, 
the word coming in a strangled sound from my throat. The next instant he had sprung upon me. I heard a noise of something rattling above, and saw a huge shadow descending upon me. I did not know what it was, and I felt certain that I was being murdered. The next moment all was lost in unconsciousness. Bell, how queer you look! Was it— was it Murdoch? But it could not have been. He was very ill in bed at Liverpool. What in the name of goodness was the awful horror through which I had lived? I can assure you on one point, I answered. It was no ghost. And, as to Murdoch, it is more than likely that you did see him. I then told the poor fellow what I had discovered with regard to the agent— and also my firm conviction that Wickham was at the bottom of it. Cressley's astonishment was beyond bounds, and I saw at first that he scarcely believed me. But when I said that it was my intention to search the house, he accompanied me. We both, followed by Mitchell, returned to the ill-fated room. But, though we examined the tapestry and panelling, we could not find the secret means by which the villain had obtained access to the chamber. "'The carriage which brought me here is still waiting just outside the lodge-gates,' I said. "'What do you say to leaving this place at once, and returning at least as far as Carlton? We might spend the remainder of the night there, and take the very first train to Liverpool.' "'Anything to get away,' said Cressley. I do not feel that I can ever come back to Cressley Hall again. You feel that now, but by and by your sensations will be different, I answered. As I spoke, I called Mitchell to me. I desired him to go at once to the lodge gates and ask the driver of the wagonette to come down to the hall. This was done, and half an hour afterwards Cressley and I were on our way back to Carlton. Early the next morning we went to Liverpool. There we visited the police, and I asked to have a warrant taken out for the apprehension of Murdoch. The superintendent, on hearing my tale, suggested that we should go at once to Murdoch's house in Melville Gardens. We did so, but it was empty, Murdoch, his wife, and Wickham having thought it best to decamp. The superintendent insisted, however, on having the house searched— and in a dark closet at the top we came upon a most extraordinary contrivance. This was no less than an exact representation of the agent's head and neck in wax. In it was a wonderfully skilful imitation of a human larynx, which, by a cunning mechanism of clockwork, could be made exactly to simulate the breathing and low moaning of a human being. This the man had, of course, utilised, with the connivance of his wife and Wickham, in order to prove an alibi. And the deception was so complete that only my own irresistible curiosity could have enabled me to discover the secret. That night the police were fortunate enough to capture both Murdoch and Wickham in a Liverpool slum. Seeing that all was up, the villains made complete confession, and the whole of the black plot was revealed. It appeared that two adventurers— the worst form of scoundrels, knew of Cressley's great discovery in Western Australia, and had made up their minds to forestall him in his claim. One of these men had come some months ago to England, and while in Liverpool had made the acquaintance of Murdoch. The other man, Wickham, accompanied Cressley on the voyage, in order to keep him in view, and worm as many secrets as possible from him. When Cressley spoke of his superstition with regard to the turret-room, it immediately occurred to Wickham to utilise the room for his destruction. Murdoch proved a ready tool in the hands of the rogues. They offered him an enormous bribe, and then the three between them evolved the intricate and subtle details of the crime. It was arranged that Murdoch was to commit the ghastly deed, and for this purpose he was sent down quietly to Brent, disguised as a journeyman, the day before Cressley went to the hall. The men had thought that Cressley would prove an easy prey, but they distrusted me from the first. Their relief was great when they discovered that I could not accompany Cressley to the hall, and had he spent the first night there, the murder would have been committed. 
but his nervous terrors inducing him to spend the night at Brent foiled this attempt. Seeing that I was returning to Liverpool, the men now thought that they would use me for their own devices, and made up their minds to decoy me into Murdoch's bedroom, in order that I might see the wax figure, their object, of course, being that I should be forced to prove an alibi, in case Murdoch was suspected of the crime. The telegram which reached me at Prince's Hotel on my return from London was sent by one of the ruffians, who was lying in ambush at Brent. When I left Murdoch's house, the wife informed Wickham that she thought from my manner I suspected something. He had already taken steps to induce the cab-driver to take me in a wrong direction, in order that I should miss my train, and it was not until he visited the stables outside the Prince's Hotel that he found that I intended to go by road. He then played his last card, when he telegraphed to the inn at Carlton to stop the horses. By Murdoch's means, Wickham and his confederate had the run of the rooms at the hall ever since the arrival of Wickham from Australia, and they had rigged up the top of the old bedstead in the way I have described. There was, needless to say, a secret passage at the back of the tapestry, which was so cunningly hidden in the panelling as to baffle all ordinary means of discovery. You've been listening to a bite-sized audiobook, read by me, Simon Stanhope. If you'd like to help me to keep producing new content, you can find links in the video description to my Patreon page, or to buy me a coffee. Another way to support me is through my Bandcamp page, bitesizedaudio.bandcamp.com, where you can hear my narrations of many more classic short stories, and you can also purchase and download them to keep. This recording is copyright Bite-Sized Audio 2023. Thank you for listening.